People, I can't even with this news day. <laughs> These, this is the list of sound bites that we were go going to go to air with moments ago. Then <laughs> we got the legal bombshell out of the Florida federal court. Just buckle up. I don't remember a news day this jam packed in my time as a newswoman. I, I don't remember one. Welcome to the show, everyone. I'm Megan Kelly. On Saturday night at a campaign rally in Butler, Pennsylvania, former President Donald Trump dodged a literal bullet, which grazed his ear in an assassination attempt that he survived, but came within inches of taking his life. This morning, Mr. Trump dodged perhaps the biggest legal bullet left in the lawfare chamber against him, as Judge Aileen Cannon dismissed the Mar-a-Lago classified documents case in full against him. Oh, and by the way, the Republican National Convention kicks off today, a more unified convention than previously planned. Former Trump rival Nikki Haley now expected to take the stage, DeSantis as well. And Trump says he will name his VP pick any minute, <laughs> any minute right now. Uh, reports by Forbes that J.D. Vance just left his, just left for, uh, left his home in a motorcade. Now, that's not typical of a U.S. senator, I think, uh, but they are beefing up the security for all potential Trump VPs. So that doesn't necessarily tell us anything. We're on edge waiting to hear the name. We're going to cover it all, including shocking new reporting about the security failures leading up to the assassination attempt and some stunning video that we have our hands on I've watched this several times. I can't believe my eyes. But we begin with the breaking legal news out of Florida. Joining me now, Mike Davis, founder of the Article 3 Project, live from the RNC site today in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and Dave Ehrenberg, state attorney for Palm Beach County, Florida, where Mar-a-Lago is located. Mike and Dave have been with us covering every twist and turn of this case. Don't miss a moment. Subscribe to this show on YouTube and follow me on Insta, Facebook, and X. If you were not following the news, a massive hit to the U.S. dollar just came in June when Saudi Arabia did not renew its 50-year petrodollar deal with the U.S. Since 1974, Saudi Arabia has sold oil exclusively in U.S. dollars, and that was huge to our global economic dominance. Now they want options other than the dollar. So ask yourself, if there's less demand for the U.S. dollar, what happens next? Look, it's reasons like this that Americans are looking at Birch Gold Group. For over 20 years, Birch Gold has helped tens of thousands of Americans protect their savings by diversifying their investments and converting an IRA or 401k into an IRA in physical gold. To learn more, just text MK to 989898 and claim your free no obligation info kit on gold. They're not about pressuring you. They're about giving you another real option to this market. That's MK to the number 989898. Birch Gold has earned the trust of so many with their education-first approach, their thousands of happy customers, their A-plus rating from the Better Business Bureau, and many, many five-star reviews. Consider protecting your savings with gold before the dollar plunges any further. Text MK to 989898 now. Guys, welcome on this historic day. Dave is overseas. On your honeymoon, Dave, you're such a trooper. Thank you so much for phoning in. God bless and congrats. Thanks. Thank you, Megan. I give all thanks to Sasha, my bride, because she allowed me to do your show. She thinks that highly of you, Megan, and of Mike. Oh, oh, God bless you both. Thank you so much for being here. And Mike, what a day. The, this was the case with the most legal peril. The three of us have discussed it many times, and it's not a partial victory. It's a complete victory, and it also may have a side effect of gutting what's left, the tatters of the January 6th case in which Jack Smith is also a special counsel. So explain briefly why Judge Cannon just got rid of this case, Mike. So we had the office of the independent counsel uh, under Ken Starr, most famously, that was created by statute, a statute passed by Congress. It's an office created by Congress, which is required under the Constitution. And then once Congress intentionally allowed the Office of the Independent Counsel to lapse because people were upset about Ken Starr's investigation of then-President Clinton, uh, the Justice Department just tried to do an end run 
around the uh, the the lapse of the office of the independent counsel, and they create it by fiat, by regulation, the office of special counsel, and they created this office uh, that essentially. Uh, it's not presidentially appointed and Senate confirmed like a like the attorney general, like a United States attorney. And this this office of special counsel essentially had jurisdiction that all over the country had a, a, a you know pretty near full power of every U.S. attorney in this country. And it had essentially an unlimited budget. And that is that violates two provisions of the Constitution, the appointments clause which uh, which 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 states that the offices must be created by Congress and they must be appointed by the president, confirmed by the Senate. And then it also violated the appropriations clause, because with this essentially unlimited budget, it's not uh, that this office is not accountable to Congress. Right. So that's the problem. And, the, and what what needs to happen is if President Biden wants to bring these charges or the attorney general wants to bring these charges against President Trump, they need to do it through a Senate confirmed United United States attorney. They can do it through the United States attorney for the Southern District of Florida uh, down in Miami. They can bring these charges if they want to refile them, but you can't do it through this special counsel because this special counsel is not accountable to Congress. It's not accountable to the attorney general. It, it's a, they actually made it where the, the special counsel is in, intentionally, they made it intentionally where the, this special counsel is not accountable to the attorney general on a day-to-day -day basis. And that is clearly unconstitutional. It's basically just a separations of powers thing. It says, you know, the, the court says, look, it's the president who gets to appoint people to uh, these positions, uh, special counsel or, or U.S. attorney, that kind of thing. And then the Congress weighs in with the confirmation. And only for inferior offices can Congress create, you know, a process that might look a little different. And there is, that didn't happen here. So Jack Smith has not been nominated by President Biden to do anything, nor any president prior, you know, for this appointment. And he hasn't, certainly hasn't been confirmed by the U.S. Congress and nobody authorized payment to him and the Congress controls the purse strings. So all of this is extra legal. It's extra constitutional, which means it's unconstitutional. But the thing is, Dave, other courts have taken a look at this argument in the past. And it does appear that Judge Aileen Cannon is one of the few to find this way, right? Other courts have been like, yeah, no, it's not a problem. She's saying, you know what? It is a problem. And while she may look like a bit of an outlier, she's got something very helpful in her back pocket. And that is Clarence Thomas's concurrence in the decision finding Trump has immunity for most of the things alleged against him, which we read to our audience when it happened as a very important piece of what might happen in getting rid of the Mar-a-Lago case. And sure enough, Judge, Judge Cannon saw it, raised it and felt as he did. Right. Notably, no other Supreme Court justice signed on to Justice Thomas's concurring opinion. This position that Judge Cannon has taken is an outlier, as you correctly said. There, I don't know of any other judge who has ruled her way. Many other judges have found the opposite. In fact, uh, former President Trump thought this was such a reach of an argument that he did not raise it in the D.C. election interference case or in this case. He didn't raise it originally in the Mar-a-Lago case, except uh, then the conservatives came in from the outside and raised it. And then Judge Cannon allowed them not only to submit a brief, but then to make the oral argument. And I, I mean, I, I think this case is definitely headed towards the Supreme Court. It's going to go to the 11th Circuit, then the Supreme Court. And it is an outlier of an opinion. I, I'm surprised by it. You know, um, I understand the argument that uh, when they say that Jack Smith is acting too independently. But remember, the rhetoric coming from Donald Trump and his legal team has been Jack Smith is is a pawn for Joe Biden. Joe Biden and Merrick Garland are pulling the strings here. So which is it? Is it that Jack Smith? Well, those are political is, arguments. And this 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 whole thing comes down to what is in the Constitution. And, you know, there was a good piece in the Wall Street Journal by um, former judge and then AG Michael Mukasey uh, about, uh, it was July 7th. And he was pointing out, you know, the actual language of the Constitution that, you know, Trump's gonna argue what he's gonna argue. His rhetoric is kind of beside the point he's pointing to the appointments clause and it's article two, section two, clause two, which provides the exclusive means for appointing officers of the U S all must be appointed by the president and confirmed by the Senate. If they are inferior officers like 
she said, okay, I'll accept for purposes of this decision that Jack Smith as a special counsel is an inferior officer. She's like, but I actually have questions about whether he would qualify. Then Congress may vest the appointment in the president, the courts, or the heads of departments, like potentially an attorney general. Um, but they didn't. That's what Mike's saying. They, they didn't do that. They, there is not a special counsel statute saying we will allow the AG to create this kind of special prosecutor and go out there and take cases. And then also she she bounced them based on the appropriations clause saying um, this prohibits money from the Treasury going out to people if it hasn't been appropriated by Congress, which this hasn't. So that's how she got here. But let's and, and, and look, it'll be appealed to the 11th Circuit, which is more conservative. Um and then it'll go up to the Supreme Court potentially, we'll see. But here's what I really wanna to get to, because the, the decision is what it is for today. So what are the practical, I'll ask you this one, Dave, just to, to start. What are the practical effects of this decision now on this case, the election and January 6th, that case? Well, this case was never going to go before the election. The trial was never gonna happen before the election once Judge Cannon got on it. and I. I think that uh, Judge Cannon doesn't get the benefit of the doubt here because she has made very controversial rulings from the beginning on this case that led her to be taken off the matter by the 11th Circuit. So this is going to the 11th Circuit, and then I, th I think it goes to the Supreme Court. But I think that Jack Smith now has the ability to try to get Judge Cannon removed from the case. And as far because as she's so found, she found exactly as a sitting justice of the United States Supreme Court found Clarence Thomas. She's such an outlier and so crazy in her decision that a U.S. Supreme Court justice felt the need to out outline exactly this position. When a referee makes the calls every single time for the same team, you have uh, reason to doubt the impartiality of that referee. Oh, and I think where was that happen. argument with Judge Mershon? Back in the New York State Supreme, please. Overwhelmingly, he ruled in favor of the prosecution. He gave Trump a few, but overwhelm. That's not how yeah. you go. It, uh, zero chance that Judge Eileen, Eileen Cannon is getting DQ'd on this case at any point. That's my view. Mike, um, so what do, do, does January 6th go away too? Because Jack Smith, if he's illegal in one, he's illegal in all. Well, this decision by uh, Judge Cannon is only binding on that case in the Southern District of Florida. It's not binding on Judge Chutkin. In the dist uh, in in D.C., it's persuasive, and I think that Trump can point to it, and and ask for a dismissal. But look, here's the bottom line: these President Biden, these Biden Democrats, they tried to bankrupt Trump, they tried to uh, throw him in prison for the rest of his life, they tr they tried to throw him off the ballot, and now uh, one of these anti-Trump people tried to kill him. Their, P President Trump is unstoppable. Right. He's going to get elected in a landslide on November 5th. He's going to take office on January 20th. And these federal cases are going to go away on day one, as they should. Um, does this mean anything, Dave, for either the Hunter Biden prosecution, which is different because it had a special prosecutor, but that special prosecutor is a U.S. attorney. He's, he has been appointed and confirmed. So in my view, on that case, is he's still legit. He's OK. Um, or the Robert Herr investigation of President Biden, which has concluded without charges, but there is some cleanup going on there right now as congressional Republicans try to get the audio tape or videotape of his interview of Joe Biden, but he is not a federal officer at present, right? And wasn't when he, when he was acting as special counsel against Joe Biden. So does this have any effect on those two? I agree with Mike. I think this is just confined to the Southern District of Florida. And as it works its way up to the Supreme Court, then the breadth of the ruling could potentially affect all future special counsels. It, it shouldn't affect the stuff in the in the past. I mean, Robert Herr, John Durham, David Weiss, Robert Mueller. We've seen special counsels over and over again. And this is the first time that one has been you know, tossed out because of being unconstitutional. I, I, I must add this. Uh, it's true that the uh, federal regulations say that the attorney general does not provide the day to day supervision of Jack Smith. But the AG does ensure that Jack Smith adheres to Justice Department protocols and the AG can review major investigatory steps. So it's not a totally independent special counsel. It's an inferior officer. And that's why I think the 11th Circuit is likely to overturn this. But after the immunity decision, which I totally 
uh, got wrong. I, I thought it was going to be much more limited. And Mike Davis got it right. Who knows where the Supreme Court's going to go on this? And the thing is, you're right that nobody joined Thomas in his concurrence raising this issue about Jack Smith and whether he's an appropriate special counsel. But they, one of the criticisms Thomas got for pointing this out was this wasn't raised in the immunity case. So usually the Supreme Court won't opine on something that's not immediately before it and requiring them to, to opine on it. It was sort of an extra add on. One of the reasons it was an extraordinary thing to read. But it, the, the rest of the justices haven't tipped their hand at all. The fact that they didn't join him in the concurrence doesn't surprise me at all because it wasn't before them. Um, but I don't know that we're able to say how they're going to decide this. But in any event, Mike, you t in any event, Mike, you tell me it's it's irrelevant because Trump has dodged a serious bullet, legal bullet. He dodged an actual bullet, pretty much, on Saturday, and this is this is huge. The the obstruction piece of this case. Forget the withholding classified documents. The obstruction piece or he didn't turn over all the documents when demanded, was the most problematic of all the legal warfare against him. And it's, for right now, gone. And if he does win in November, as you just predicted, all he has to do is pull that horse back by the bridle and say, we're not pursuing this case anymore within the DOJ. And then it's officially done. There'll be no appeal. Any appeal in process will be ended. It's truly over. I would say this, that President Biden should be very happy that the Supreme Court and the Fisher case uh, ended those political persecutions of those January 6th defendants. I think President Biden should be very happy. The Supreme Court said that the president of the United States is immune from criminal prosecution for his official acts. And I think President Biden should be very happy that Judge Eileen Cannon said that the special counsel is unconstitutional under both the appropriations clause and the appointments clause, because guess what? President Trump's going to be back in office on January 20th. And uh, Joe Biden is the biggest winner of these cases. Mm, Donald Trump weighing in, uh, telling Brett Baer, I'm thrilled that a judge had the courage and wisdom to do this. This has big, big implications, not just for this case, but other cases as well. The special counsel worked with everyone to try to take me down. This is a big, big deal. It only makes this convention more positive. This will be an amazing week. My God, I mean, I think we can all agree it's already been an amazing week. Uh, let me ask you, Dave, Lawrence Tribe, you know, leftist uh, lawyer at Harvard and professor, and he is saying DOJ must appeal right away and then said um, an alternative path would be for the DOJ to abandon the special counsel regulation and just refile the case without a special counsel in D.C., like go through a U.S. attorney, just refile the case in D.C., or I guess they could refile it in Florida, too. I'm assuming he doesn't like that jurisdiction because it, it would go back to Judge Aileen Cannon, who he doesn't like. But he, even he says that would be optically terrible and set a terrible precedent. Do you think that will happen? Democrats are so worried about optics because from the beginning, Judge, uh, uh, Jack Smith could have filed this case in D.C., but they didn't like the optics of that. They want to do it where the crimes allegedly occurred in the Southern District of Florida. I thought that was a good move because if he filed it in D.C. and if they go ahead and refile this in D.C., then I do think that Trump and his legal team would have a valid claim that there's a venue problem here because the obstruction that's being alleged occurred at Mar-a-Lago in South Florida. The illegal retention of documents really occurred down there. And so I think it is possible they could refile this in D.C. under Merrick Garland and the attorney general's office. But I think then they would be buried in venue arguments for months to come. And then, of course, you're right. If Trump becomes president again, then this whole thing goes away. You, you guys, I mean, I think this is the day we can officially say he did it. He did it, Mike. He pulled the inside straight. Yes, there was a conviction in New York. He's not going to jail for that. I just, I, I show me otherwise. He's not, maybe, maybe they'll get a jail sentence. It'll be suspended. There's, Trump's not going to serve any real time on that. Um, Georgia's gone for now and probably will stay gone because it's going up an appeal, whether she was improperly left on the case, Fannie Willis, because of her affair with Nathan Wade. An absolutely self-inflicted error that she never should have done. I'm sure she's kicking herself and so are Democrats for such a stupid move in a case. And now January 6th has been gutted by the immunity decision and the January 6th Supreme Court decision, not to mention potentially this alien Cannon decision, which could be persuasive. And the worst case of all for Trump, Florida just went away. He did it, Mike Davis. 
He's he's Teflon Don. He do, he dodged the real bullet. He dodged these legal bullets. I would make one clarification. President Trump has not been convicted in New York yet. He has been found guilty by a jury, mm-hmm. and I actually think appeal. that this well until the judge convicts and sentences, and they the judge has moved back the the date from uh, back to what was it, September 18th. I actually think there is a reasonable chance that Judge Mershon declares a mistrial in that New York case because of the presidential immunity decision where they uh, they got evidence from President Trump's top White House staffers, Hope Hicks, and then President Trump's uh, deputy chief of staff for operations. They got Madeline, I forgot her last name, but they they got evidence from those two White House officials that is subject to presidential immunity and so that the Supreme Court made it, made very clear in its decision that you can't use evidence that is subject to presidential immunity that for that legal ground alone, there should be a mistrial. Dave, what do you make of my assessment? Like he, he fought as somebody famous once said, he fought the law, but the law did not win. It's my take on the famous face. Like it's incredible. It, it is. Remember, it's it's not there was nothing nefarious about getting Judge Cannon as his judge. That was just bad luck for Jack Smith. Jack Smith asked for this to go to the West Palm Beach Division. That limited the number of judges. And once they got Judge Cannon, this case was never going to be heard before the election. And then as far as the other cases, yeah, Fonnie Willis, that was a self-inflicted wound there. The case in New York did happen. I, I don't I have to disagree with Mike. I think Judge Mershon is going to sentence him. Uh, in September. Uh, but then I thought the uh, strong case in D.C., the election interference case, I thought that would go before the election, too. And then the Supreme Court stepped in and said, nope, not so fast. So, yeah, he has been lucky. And sometimes it's better to be lucky than good. Good gracious. What a time. Mike, Dave, thank you. Dave, enjoy your honeymoon and all of our best to your beautiful bride. She's a lucky woman. When we thank come you, back, Megan. we turn to former President Trump surviving the assassination attempt at a rally on Saturday. We have two former Secret Service security experts joining us to get into exactly how this happened and how we're going to get to the bottom of it. And then the incredible media meltdown. Stand by. Let me tell you a story about a guy named Leo Grillo. Leo was on a road trip and came across a Doberman. This dog was severely underweight and clearly in trouble. Leo rescued the dog and named him Delta. Sadly, Delta was just one of many animals that needed help, and this inspired Leo to start Delta Rescue, the largest no-kill, care-for-life animal sanctuary in the world. They have rescued thousands of dogs, cats, and horses from the wilderness, and they provide their animals with shelter, love, safety, and a home. April marked 45 years since Leo rescued Delta. Delta Rescue relies solely on contributions to stay open. And if you would like caring for these animals to be part of your legacy, speak with your estate planner because There are tax benefits, too. You can grow your estate while letting your love for animals live well into the future. Check out the estate planning tab on their website to learn more and speak with your advisor. We say dogs are a man's best friend for a reason. You can help those who need it most. Visit DeltaRescue.org today to learn more. That's DeltaRescue.org. Our nation today at a crossroads facing a moral dilemma. Less than 48 hours after the attempted assassination of former President Donald Trump. It's a story, if we're honest, that we feared we would have to report on one day, and not just us. A lot of you wrote into us about it. Some of our friends in more right-leaning and honest media talked about it and then got ridiculed and ripped. What happened in tiny Butler, Pennsylvania on Saturday evening threatens to undermine everything we hold dear. There are serious questions about this tragedy that killed one, injured others, including the former president and presumptive nominee of the Republican Party in this presidential race, Donald Trump. An investigation into the security failures is already underway on multiple levels, both internally at the Secret Service and now several House and Senate committees are doing a deep dive in which there will be hearings and testimony that is compelled of those involved. But we cannot ignore the unhinged rhetoric from politicians and, yes, some in the media around this event. We're going to look into all of that. But first, I want to walk you through what we've learned about the attack. And thank you for joining us on our Saturday evening live stream as Things were unfolding. For those of you who missed it and would like to watch it, it's posted on YouTube still under uh, live. Here's what we know so far for sure. As Mr. Trump delivered remarks, a would-be assassin managed to climb onto a rooftop that was about a football field and a half away from him. Anywhere between 130 and 150 yards are the estimates. 
separated a killer from the former president of the United States. Mr. Trump almost died on Saturday. Almost died, very clearly. He almost got his head shot off on national television. That's what happened. Keep that in mind as you read the media and their write-ups of this event. Eagle-eyed spectators actually noticed the man. They noticed the civilian. He was not in any sort of black outfit, bulletproof vest. He wasn't trying to impersonate Secret Service. And they called out to law enforcement for help. You can hear the alarm in their voices. As they're like, he's right there. He's right there. Looking for any law enforcement on scene, which, yes, was outside the Secret Service security perimeter, but within eyesight of where the president was then speaking and couldn't find anybody. However, eventually someone got the word because based on the video we're about to show you, law enforcement did get involved moments hereafter, but dragged its feet. Watch this. Look, they're all pointing. Yeah, someone's on top of the roof. Look. There he is right there. Multiple people. Right there. See him? The shooter. He's laying down. Yeah, he's laying down. And Scott, I'm here with you fighting cartel to get a sentence. What's happening? And the military will take back the White House because if we do, we're going to make America better than other people. We're going to make it. Yeah, look. There he is. Because we have millions and millions of people in our country that shouldn't be here. readjusting his body position. Cramping up. Getting comfortable. We have cramping position. We have people that should not be here. Right here. Right on the roof. It's much tougher than here. It Again, adjusting. That video is horrifying. There's no other word for it. A killer lying in wait. The people down below, these are middle-aged women, men. They all see it. If you watch the video, you'll see, I don't know, maybe 10 who are looking at him, pointing, saying, there he is, there he is. And if you look behind them, they are 20, 15, 20 feet away from the back of the Trump crowd. How is that outside the security perimeter, by the way? There appears to be little to no urgency from the people tasked with protecting the former and possibly future president. How is it that for that amount of time that we just saw on video, we don't know how long it went on prior to that, no one from law enforcement swarmed the area, never mind the rooftop. What's more, we've learned that one officer, local cop, actually did confront the shooter. We believe it was in response to these civilians. Went up on the roof, we're told, but retreated when the gunman pointed a rifle at him, which allowed the gunman to then open fire reportedly immediately thereafter on Mr. Trump and the crowd. It's truly unbelievable. And yet the former president survived, perhaps only thanks to God, who I believe must have been protecting him that day. I just it's just there's no other logical explanation. A man was killed trying to save his wife and his daughter, and it's Horrific what happened to him. The leader of our country, former and possibly next, was spared. We're going to show you a clip now. You will hear Mr. Trump speaking, and then he slightly tilts his head to the side. And I do mean slightly. He was gesturing, gesturing toward the slides he had brought to show the illegal immigration problem off to his right. And that is why he tilted his head ever so slightly. Shots ring out. He grabs at his right ear. The time is 6.11 p.m., roughly six minutes into his speech. Watch. Take a look at what happened. Look at this. An inch or two in the other direction, and we could be talking about the unimaginable. Within seconds, his Secret Service detail would surround him. An image from the scene widely circulated over the weekend, shows a female agent here on screen left crouching down behind all the other agents who are protecting Trump. And it does appear that she is frozen in fear. That's an assumption. We'll wait to hear her explanation about why she's there. Were there concentric circles that you're supposed to form around the president? I don't know. Doesn't look good. This is a woman who is trained to take a bullet for her protectee. She appears to be the one later who was unable to holster her weapon in separate video. According to a published transcript from CNN, a female agent is also heard asking, what are we doing? What are we doing? Where are we going? It is unclear whether that's the same agent as well. Listen here.
A male urgent agent is then heard instructing people to take the former president to a spare limousine. Less than a minute after the first shots rang out, law enforcement confirms the shooter's down, taken out by a sniper. And that brings us to the moment that will go down in history. As the agents attempt to move him, Mr. Trump tells them to wait, wait. He doesn't know whether there's a second shooter. By the way, neither do the Secret Service. And with blood dripping down his face, he lifts his fist into the air, the same fist that just touched his bloody head where he took a bullet that grazed his upper right outer ear and mouths the words, fight, over and over. Watch. Trying to tell the crowd he was okay. They would be okay. We would be okay. He understood on some internal level what they needed and what the rest of us needed. Who would have the presence of mind and the courage to do that? I heard someone online, I can't forgive me, I can't remember where I heard it. It was a podcast saying he reacted the way every man alive, alive wishes and hopes and prays he would react. God forbid they found themselves in that situation. I think that's right. Our country still does value courage, bravery, resilience, temerity, strength. And it's one of the reasons people love Trump. He's the embodiment of it. For our YouTube audience, if you haven't seen this, please go look at this moment as Mr. Trump lifts his fist in the air with the American flag waving behind him. Not for nothing, but he was shot at 6.11 p.m. Couple people have sent this to me. 6.11 p.m. You read Apesians 6.11 in the Bible. It reads as follows in part. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. 6.11, he was shot, and that's 6.11. Listen to that. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. I'm almost emotional reading it. It's just what happened to him and our country this weekend is extremely grave and extremely important. And we are all so lucky it wasn't worse than it, than it was. Um, we'll get into the victim of this attack and the disgusting attacks on him still. His memory, 50-year-old firefighter, father of two young girls who are grieving today along with his widow, and they attack him for his politics, for a silly political joke he made online one time. Where, are, where is their soul? Where are their hearts? Today, Mr. Trump is in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, for the opening of the Republican National Convention. He says he's tossed out his original speech and will call for a new effort at national unity. Tucker Carlson has apparently spoken to the president and said he's changed. He, he thinks he's changed, that taking a bullet to, in the face will do that to you. In a statement released on Sunday, the former president also acknowledged it was God alone who prevented the unthinkable from happening to him. He paid tribute to the other victims and said in this moment, it is more important than ever that we stand united. And he went on to say, I truly love our country. He told the New York Post he is supposed to be dead today. As for the man who tried to kill him, here's what we've learned. 20-year-old Thomas Matthew Crooks was identified by the FBI on Sunday. The feds say he was not known to the agency prior to the attempted assassination. As you know, we normally do not name mass shooters on this program because they desire infamy and we decline to help. We've made an exception given that this is a presidential assassination. The name is already ubiquitous. The feds say there was no indication of mental health issues, though I've got to be honest, tough to believe. Let's wait. He had a limited social media presence. Also interesting. His politics are unclear, but we're going to learn more about all of that. State voting records show he was a registered Republican, but Federal Election Commission documents show a donor with the same name, age, and address gave money to a Democratic fundraising group on January 20th, 2021, the day of President Biden's inauguration. All right, I am, I am telling you this because the moronic left-wing press has spent the past two, day, two days saying, he's a registered Republican, he's a, he's a Republican, you absolute inane idiots. Yeah, he seemed like a big Donald Trump fan, didn't he? What are you saying? Like, he, he secretly was a Republican, so we can't blame this on Democratic ref, uh, rhetoric. What? 
Is your point he loved Trump? Is that what you're, he killed him out of love? Is that where we're going to go? I mean, like, just stop. Just stop that. I, I don't understand the insanely stupid argument that is being made over that. And the same outlets that are reporting he was a registered Republican are nine times out of 10 ignoring the fact that he was making donations to the Democrats, at least this one. All right. So I don't know why he registered Republican. I don't know why he donated to a Democrat group. I do know he shot Donald Trump. So just stop. Stop. CNN and the New York Times reporting that the man's father is a registered libertarian. His mother's a registered Democrat. My mom's a registered Democrat too. You know, that doesn't tell us what his politics are. Both parents are licensed professional counselors, which is sort of interesting according to state records. The shooter was from an affluent area. He used a gun that had been legally purchased by his father. Uh, his father told the local press, I, I, I don't want to talk until I know what the hell is going on. And I've spoken to law enforcement. Uh, the shooter has been described as a loner, was apparently rejected by his high school's rifle team. Here's a former classmate. I didn't have any interaction with him, but he was a, like a kid that was always alone. He was always bullied. Uh, Every day, he was just an outcast. Uh, yeah. I mean, he would sit alone at lunch. I mean, he was just an outcast, and you know how kids are nowadays, so they're going to see someone like that, and they're going to target him because they think it's funny or whatever. So it's the best way I can describe it. And it's honestly kind of sad. Like, I don't want to say this is what provoked it, but you never know. And you said he was a loner? Yeah. Um, I want to say he was a loner more because he was just, he was quiet, but like he was just bullied. Like he was bullied so much, so much. He was just made fun of, I guess, for the way he dressed or his appearance. How did he dress? Uh, like they were just saying jeans. He'd wear hunting outfits sometimes. Uh, I, he would always wear a mask. Even after COVID, he, he wore a mask. The shooter did belong to a local gun club, which has a 200-yard rifle range. Remember, he fired at former President Trump from less than that. Various news outlets have reported that he had explosive material found both in his car and at his home. And there are some reports that law enforcement believes he may have expected to survive the shooting and unleash further carnage. Now, as we continue to piece together what went wrong, we are faced with a choice. Who do we want to be as a nation? Perhaps we can glean the answer from another tragic event at another time when our nation seemed irretrievably broken. On the night Abraham Lincoln was assassinated, he wore a wool and silk lined coat. It was the same coat he had worn just a month prior to deliver his second inaugural address. Inside are stitched the words, one country, one destiny. Are we one or are we not? Are we worth saving or aren't we? Do we want what's best for our nation, for our children, or don't we? Is this the country we want them to grow up in? Let's hope for all of our sakes we can find our way back to one country, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Can't help feeling that bit by bit, these horrific events, as awful as they are, may eventually, not immediately, push us closer to that. I just don't think that the reasonable, normal American citizen wants to live like this. Joining me now, we bring you three experts to analyze the Trump assassination attempt on Saturday. Sean Parnell is a decorated combat veteran and host of Battleground with Sean Parnell. Sean has been on the program many times. He was within feet of Trump at the rally on Saturday and has spoken, had spoken on stage earlier that afternoon. Charles Marino, former Secret Service agent and author of Terrorists on the Border and in Our Country, and John Spears, a Special Forces sniper and sniper trainer for law enforcement and military and author of Warlord of the Unraveling. Guys, welcome, all of you, to the show. Thank you so much for being here. Sean, you were one of the first people I thought of on Saturday. I knew you'd be there. Um, tell us what you experienced and what stands out to you now, 48 hours out. So much, Megan, and, and your intro is fantastic. And you mentioned spirituality and faith and religion. And, and let me tell you, I've been on the stage with President Trump five times now, 
And from the moment that I walked into that rally and people can call me crazy or whatever, but there was something different. There was something in the air. And, and the reason why I know this is because on June 10, 2006 in Afghanistan, and I've not really told this story before, I was blown up and wounded pretty seriously, fractured my skull, got blown up by a rocket propelled grenade. And I was unconscious, but I felt something. I didn't know if I had already died or what, but I felt like something was beckoning me to get back in the fight. Something that like a spiritual presence that really felt like my grandfather who I lost the day before I went to Afghanistan. When I was on that stage speaking, I felt that same damn thing. And people for 48 hours have been sending me images of the flag because I guess the wind had blown it and you know kind of got it tangled but sent me images of the flag from different angles, just convinced that there was something going on. It was surreal, call it an omen, say it was something spiritual. I don't know. Looked like an angel. And they fixed the flag moments before Trump came out on that stage. And again, I just talked to the president 30 minutes prior before he walked out. But there was something in the air. I mean, again, people call me crazy or whatever, but there was something different about that day. And you're right. It, President Trump, he, he called for this. Oh, hey, you know, you got my favorite immigration graphic. You know, I go off script. I tell my people, like, I hate this teleprompter stuff. And they get the graphic up there. He looks once because he's got these screens behind him. It was right there with him. And he looks twice. And then six shots ring out. And I could hear the bullets, just the trajectory of the bullets. I could hear them going supersonic, cracking through the air right above my wife and I. And I saw President Trump grab his ear. A second later, the Secret Service was on him. And then I heard thump, thump of the counter sniper team. And then another couple of rounds, which was almost simultaneous. And those rounds hit people directly behind me. It was a crazy, chaotic day. But I wanted to bring up the faith component because I don't care what people th say, think, Believe everyone has different beliefs in this country, and we welcome that. But there was something in the air that day, and it felt different. Wow. I believe you. And you were not only so close to the president, Sean, but you were close, as I understand it, to some of the the other victims who mm -hmm. were hit. The, the man uh, who died is uh, named Corey Comparatore, age 50, husband, father of two, and... Um, his daughter, Allison, posted uh, on, I think it's Facebook today, saying in part, he was the best dad a girl could ever ask for. Uh, my sister and I never needed for anything. He could talk and make friends with anyone, which he was doing all day yesterday and loved every minute of it. He was a man of God, loved Jesus fiercely, and also looked after our church and our members as family. He died a real life superhero. She says, the media is not going to tell you how quickly he threw my mom and me to the ground. They are not going to tell you that he shielded my body from the bullet that came at us. He loved his family. He truly loved us enough to take a real bullet for us. And I want nothing more than to cry on him now and tell him, thank you. Oh, my God. This is hard to read. This poor young woman. I don't know how old she and her sister are. They look like they're maybe in their mid to late teens. Um, firefighter already in public service and um, gone too soon, age 50, just for going to a political rally to support a candidate. He jumped on his family. Sean, I, I want to ask you what you saw in terms of those around you and what your instincts were in terms of protecting those around you. There's no, it's no accident you've um, been in combat. Yeah, I've, I've, hundreds of times in firefights. And I'll tell you something. You know, we often talk about the exceptional nature of this country and the fact that we are indeed an exceptional nation. But we're made exceptional not because necessarily of our political leaders, although some are inspirational and great, larger than life. Certainly Trump was that day. But our nation is exceptional because of the people. And Corey was one of those people. And there were so many patriots that day that stepped up to help other people. You know, a pathway to a meaningful life is acts of service through others with nothing, no expectation of anything in return. And the people at that rally that day stepped up, Megan, in a way that I'd never seen before. And you know, when the shots rang out, I hear the rounds crack overhead. And everybody in the crowd 
just kind of froze for a second. And I heard people saying they're just fireworks. And I said, they're not fireworks. It's a sniper. Everybody get down. Everybody get down. And people looked at me like I was crazy. I already had my wife. Been lots of been in lots of firefights in my day, but I've never been in one with my wife. <laughs> but mm -hmm. I got her down in the prone on the ground flat. And there was a uh, my friend JD Longo is the mayor of Slippery Rock Marine Combat Fed. His wife was pregnant. And to my right was 95-year-old Mrs. Fogel, whose son is languishing in a Russian prison, has been completely ignored by the Biden administration. Everybody froze. And in that moment, I one thought was going through my head, and that was trying to ascertain the position of the shooter. And within seconds, it was two, one of two locations, water tower or building. And then immediately, immediately I checked myself and I said, there's no way because the Secret Service would almost certainly have those places on lockdown. And the next question was, you know, you have to ascertain the location of the shooter to figure out whether or not you can move people and how you move people, right? How you right. use cover and concealment to get people out uh, safely. Because the reality was Secret Service had their mission. They were on the president, right? And you had local law enforcement, you had SWAT and CERT teams that were on looking for and on the shooter. Some were helping with casualty evacuation. But the truth is they were stretched way too thin. And the real question was you had 30,000 plus people there, one exit, how the hell do you get those people out of there? And when you get shot at for the first time, Everybody has this experience at some point. You sit down and you say to yourself, like, holy shit, someone just tried to kill me that's never met me before. They tried to wipe out everything that I was, that I am now, everything that I ever will be. And it takes a long time to wrap your mind around the existential enormity of that. And, you know, not everybody in the crowd I'm sure there had been people in the crowd that had been shot at before, but there were likely 30,000 people in that crowd that were experiencing something like that in that moment and needed to figure out a way to get them out of there. But, and the last thing I'll say is this, because I didn't see Trump fully stand because the Secret Service was around him, but I heard the crowd erupt in cheers. And I knew that President Trump had showed himself to the audience. But what does it say about the strength of the people whose life was in danger? And by the way, we were operating under the assumption when talking with the law enforcement as we were helping with evacuation and helping with the casualties and helping with wheelchairs, we were operating under the assumption that there were two shooters because there were two big pieces of machinery behind President Trump and a hydraulic line on the one behind him had popped and, sh and, and, and broken. So we thought there might be another shooter out there. But every single person in that crowd stayed there with him. They didn't rush. They didn't stampede. They didn't hurt anybody. And damn it, like that right there is what makes this country exceptional. Not the evil shooter who tried to do something terrible that will forever have altered the trajectory of this nation. But the people in that crowd that day supported one another. And to me, that's a major part of this story. Could not have said it better myself, Sean. That's exactly right. You know, it's the old Mr. Rogers look for the helpers. And the helpers were everywhere that day from the emergency everywhere. doctor who tried to save uh, the life of this poor man as he was dying and then realized mm -hmm. it, it was not possible um, to those who didn't cause a panic. If they had caused a panic and, and you know run for their lives and there had been some sort of a massive herd trying to get out, people always get hurt and sometimes killed in those scenarios. And that is also to Mr. Trump's credit for refusing to exit that stage until he held up his fist to show everyone he was okay and reminding them what the mission is here, right? To fight, fight for what you believe that's in. That's leadership, fight Megan, that's leadership. That, that's what it means to be a leader. You know, it, it, it to show people to stand up in that moment where the rubber meets the road to show them that you are there with them. And in that moment, Trump exhibited the leadership that this country desperately needs. And within 12 hours of someone trying to kill him, the guy's out there saying, nope, we need to unite. We need to come. Think about that. That's leadership. And Trump proved it on that stage. And by the way, uh, you know, a credit to all of those who helped those in the crowd who were older, who were scared, who didn't know what to do. And uh, I've got to give a shout out to you know, my, some of my colleagues in the press who were there, the New York Times featured an interview with a guy named Doug Mills today, their photographer, and that man did a great job of taking the pictures that we continue to show. They are iconic photos. And he talks about how he was scared. He's covered presidents back to Reagan. 
And uh, he's never been present for such a thing. And yet he continued to press his shutter. And that's the reason we have the images we have. And we know some of the trajectories of the bullets. I mean, it had to have been very scary for the photogs in particular who were within a couple of feet of the president, but did their jobs and documented true history in the making. We're going to take a quick break and we will be back. Sean, thank you. Chuck and John, stay with us. And we're going to start the next segment. Uh, so much to digest with them on where we went so wrong. Do you owe back taxes? Pandemic relief is now over. Along with hiring thousands of new agents and field officers, the IRS has kicked off 2024 by sending over 5 million pay-up letters to those who have unfiled tax returns or balances owed. Don't waive your rights and speak with them on your own. Tax Network USA, a trusted tax relief firm, has saved over $1 billion in back taxes for their clients, and they can help you secure the best deal possible. Whether you owe $10,000 or $10 million, they can help you. Whether it's business or personal taxes, even if you have the means to pay, or if you're on a fixed income, they can help you finally resolve your tax burdens once and for all. Call 1-800-245-6000 for a private free consultation, or just visit tnusa.com slash Megan. This just breaking from Reuters, this is their reporting, that the Trump campaign will announce its pick for Donald Trump's vice presidential running mate at around 4.30 p.m. Eastern today during the Republican National Convention in Milwaukee, citing a source familiar with the matter. We'll see whether that pans out, but uh, if that's true, we only have a couple of hours to wait for what it's worth. Uh, We know that at least Marco Rubio, J.D. Vance, Doug Burgum, and Glenn Youngkin are all in Milwaukee. I can't. (laughs) There's a lot. There's a lot going on today. Are you feeling it too? Um, and one of the things that's going on, going to go on today, tomorrow, and in the weeks to come is an investigation into how this happened. How did this happen? Yes, we're looking into the shooter and they're trying to get his phone unlocked right now with court permission. Um, the FBI is trying to see what's on there. That's critical. It doesn't look like so far they found any sort of a manifesto, something that would make it obvious. He had a very limited social media presence. He was on one of the lesser known uh, social media companies. And there was very little on there and he hadn't been using it for months. Again, we reported to the, at the top of the hour, he's not known to have had mental health problems though. Again, put an asterisk on that, right? We'll see, we'll see about that. I mean, clearly anybody who does this to innocent civilians and tries to assassinate a president has got some mental issues. That doesn't mean they're legally insane, uh, but we'll find out. And they're trying to unlock that phone, which will be a treasure trove of information. And I have, pretty high confidence they'll be able to do it. But in the meantime, uh, we need to figure out how the Secret Service went wrong and local law enforcement went wrong. Obviously, there was a catastrophic failure. And here with me to help in that analysis is Charles Marino, former Secret Service agent and author of Terrorists on the Border and in Our Country, and John Spears, Special Forces sniper and sniper trainer for law enforcement and military and author of Warlord of the Unraveling. Guys, thank you again for being here. So, Chuck, as a former Secret Service guy, let me start with you. Can I ask you a question? Yeah. We were just talking with Sean about how a lot of the crowd looked stunned. Some um, went down immediately to protect themselves or their family, cover their family members. President Trump, one second it took him to go down. Is that part of the training when you have a president, you know, by the Secret Service? Like, you hear gunshots. Because I just don't think, I don't know if it's human instinct as soon as you hear it to drop down as quickly as he did. Yeah, if you actually listen closely, Megan, you can hear the agents as they're responding to cover him, yelling at him to get down. And the reason why they're telling him to get down is because there's armor there on that stage behind that stars and stripes pipe and drape. So they're, they want him to immediately get behind that and then pile their bodies on top of his to give him the protection. That's that inner ring of the concentric rings of security that you were talking about. That's the mm-hmm. last line of defense for the Secret Service. They trained for a whole host of scenarios, including the worst case scenario that we saw yesterday, the attempted assassination. So there's a lot of training there, but the work of the Secret Service the efforts are put in on the front end, which is why we send agents out to do protective advance of sites prior to any protectees going there. That is to be on the proactive side and to identify 
and mitigate threats like the building that the shooter ultimately got on top of. The Secret Service is responsible for creating the overall security plan. So whether we're talking about the inner, the middle, or the outer ring of security, they own that. They are responsible for coordinating that. They are are responsible for working closely with state and local law enforcement who are supporting them to make sure that the plans are implemented effectively. And so that what you're is saying, where Chuck, is that if, if this outer perimeter was where the rooftop was, and we know that that's the case, the Secret Service doesn't get a pass by saying, well, that was outside the perimeter and we handed that over to local Pennsylvania state troopers or local law enforcement. They're, they're also responsible for that, too. That's exactly right, especially since that building is naturally going to come up uh, to the attention of the counter snipers. So it's going to fall within the security plan and only being, you know, 125 yards away with a direct line of sight to the stage. um, That's just outside that middle ring of security. So absolutely, you're going to have your attention drawn to it as an agent, as you're standing on the stage where the president's gonna stand and you look out and you see that elevated threat there. So you've gotta go out as an agent and make sure that in your overall security plan, you are drawing attention to that building, to local police and making sure that you are helping them implement a plan to post that building, to secure it, to put somebody on the roof, whatever way you need to do it, you need to make sure nobody had access to that building. And that's where we see the fail. Anytime you see agents having to respond the way they did uh, within that inner circle, that means something failed in the overall security plan and failed catastrophically. Mm -hmm, Which we, of course, saw with our own eyes. So what of these reports, Chuck, that, you know, we, we showed the video earlier of all of the people, the civilians on the ground saying he's right there. You can tell it's not a sharpshooter shooter. He's got, you know, tan shirt and white pants or maybe it's the reverse he keeps moving his body to readjust like he's getting comfortable. I mean, you can just tell, even I as a lay person can see this is not a security official. And these lay people themselves were very clued in to this guy did not belong up there and appeared to be a threat. Maybe they saw the rifle. It's just, you don't hear them say that during the clip, if I recall correctly. So what of this report that they were the ones who saw, my God, the guy's up there. And then I don't know if local law enforcement heard them say that, or local law enforcement was already on it. They certainly didn't appear to be already on it. And that they went up there and this guy turned his rifle on them and the guy went back down the ladder and then started shooting. Maybe I've watched too much TV, but in my head as this plays out, of course it shouldn't have been allowed in the first place. But once you're up there as a cop and you see a guy with an AR-15, you don't go back down the ladder. But tell me what's real. Yeah, look, the threat should have been engaged right there. I'm convinced the shooter was on a suicide mission uh, as he was making his way to the building. If he had been confronted by law enforcement, the shooting would have started between him and the law enforcement officers. I think the fact that he made it to the roof and was spotted by a police officer uh, up that ladder and no action was taken is really dereliction of duty, if true. But the reporting of a suspicious person with a weapon started much sooner. So it tells me that amongst the investigation, we're going to find that there was a significant gap in communication because if the president's detail had known that there was a a suspect armed who could not be found by local law enforcement within the area, then you would not bring the former president to the stage. You would actually keep him in the armored car until the situation was resolved. So it tells me there's a a communication uh, breakdown. But as far as the uh, investigations that are gonna come out of this, Megan, I can tell you it's gonna expand uh, well beyond just what happened uh, at that site. You're gonna see uh, people looking at the HR hiring practices of the Secret Service. You're gonna see them looking at training you're going to look at them looking at operations and resourcing. Was the former President Trump detailed given all the resources that they needed to match the threat level? They're really going to be under the microscope and there's no way to sugarcoat it. They've got a very, very rough road ahead and rightfully so. All those questions we're going to get into here. And yes, I agree. I mean, just on what we've heard so far, there are real questions about whether he was adequately staffed. And uh, let's just be honest about five foot five women standing in front of a six foot three man as 
his protector. It's absurd. It's not a question of sexism. My God, this is a joke. Uh, you don't put a five foot five woman in front of a six foot three man as his protector. You, I, the headshot was right there. Had there been another shooter, it would have been easy to take him out. I mean, the, the, the circle around President Trump was exposed. It had a massive flaw in it. This is later when they were getting him into the car. And here's the one woman who can't reholster her weapon. Again, I hate to be so critical because I can't holster a weapon, but I am not working as Secret Service. Um, let me just bring in John because you're a former sniper. And John, you know, all credit to the sniper for taking out the shooter quickly. I mean, I'm sure this is not an easy thing to do, but I, I, a lot of people are wondering, like, if you're the sniper, the, I guess he, he would be called a counter sniper, the guy up there, you know, working on behalf of the good guys. Why wouldn't that guy have noticed another man on a rooftop 150 yards away, not even, like, does he have an obligation to do something before and to notice this before shooting starts? We can answer all of that pretty easily uh, by applying rational knowledge about how these public venue operations are carried out. Right now, what's going on is there are two prevailing narratives, not even 72 hours after the failure uh, at the event. Uh, and these two narratives uh, are very destructive to the country. One uh, is that the factory building about 125 yards from the venue podium where President Trump was speaking, that that building was somehow outside the security perimeter. And we can destruct, we can deconstruct that. That's absolutely false. The other narrative that is still prevailing is that the reason there's some perceived delay in the counter sniper successfully engaging the shooter is that there was some order from Secret Service at a higher level to not shoot or that there are policies or procedures in place that keep them from responding to a threat unless they receive permission. And both of those narratives that are still persisting are very harmful to the country. Uh, the answers behind why those things aren't true may not necessarily be complementary to the local law enforcement involved, but it's way less damaging than letting the country believe that any of those things that happened were purposeful or, or, or purposeful negligence, because that is absolutely not what happened. Yes, because just to just to add to that, there was a report from um, a woman named Susan Crabtree. She's the White House and national political correspondent for Real Clear Politics. And she, citing a source in the Secret Service community, has reported quite a few things. And one of them is that it it is not protocol for Secret Service to shoot until after the target has shot first. And then NBC News came out this morning um, and reported as follows. The roof, this is again citing a Secret Service, uh, I believe, source. They say this roof was a well-known high priority vulnerability. It had been identified a day before during a security walkthrough. The counter sniper team, two people, were on site. And they said counter snipers do not need permission to shoot um, prior to engaging a suspect and said protocols here were not followed. Now, I don't know what that means, but what do you take away from that, John? Rules for use of deadly physical force never require uh, a threat to fire first before returning uh, force to end that threat. Uh, that simply does not exist. That's completely false. I don't want to speak about specific uh, policies or procedures uh, of any agency, but I mean, is a general principle rules for use of deadly physical force is that a threat is evident that they have the intent, the means, and the opportunity uh, to to present that kind of deadly threat, and a uh, person who's not supposed to be where they're observed with a weapon. And of course, as a lawyer yourself, you understand what it means to evince a deadly intent. Uh, that requires no level of authorization at any higher level. 
a so sworn officer. So what does that mean, John? Does, it, does that mean this this sniper didn't see him? Like, I got to imagine you're a Secret Service sniper. You're up there. You see this guy with an AR-15, not in any sort of law enforcement gear. And presumably, you know where your fellow law enforcement officers are stationed on nearby roofs. And you don't, it, does, it, it has to mean he didn't see him, doesn't it? Unless he just misunderstood the threat. I will provide you what is likely the explanation for the events that we saw. Um, you know, having spent 20 years working with law enforcement, special operations, snipers and public venue support uh, for SWAT, I, I can tell you what is most likely what happened. Part of this starts with the fact, believe it or not, that Secret Service is such a professional organization that demonstrates such a high level of respect for local agencies that they work with. So it's very uncommon for Secret Service to work with a local SWAT counter snipers and micromanage them or over instruct them. Right. Most likely what happened is they said, OK, that factory building, you local sniper, counter sniper team are going to occupy secure and take that building as your overwatch position as part of the operational plan. Check what they are unlikely to say is, hey, guys, you're going to observe from the roof, right? you're not going to go inside the building and try and observe and control the scene, right? You know, you're oh not going to set up an area where you have dead space, where you can't visually access your area of responsibility, right? I mean, we know it's a hot day, but you're not going to do that, right? I mean, Secret Service, uh, they're, they're the highest level of professionals, just like about all of the federal agencies I've ever worked with. And they don't go into a local scene and micromanage like that. So it's what we call, there's a lot of implied tasks and implied competence working with the local agencies. So Is that I can possible, definitely John? Is that possible that there was a local law enforcement officer in that building, responsible for that building, who just didn't secure the roof? Um, I won't tell you how I know that, but I will leave it that my conjecture based on knowledge and experience is that there was a basic lack of tactical acumen, and that is most likely what happened, which is why you do not see a counter sniper team on that building. Wow. Chuck, your reaction to that, that they just... Law, local law enforcement was supposed to cover the building. They didn't. And Secret Service may have been just too deferential to local law enforcement in their expected expertise. Yeah. So um, to the point I made earlier, uh, that would still be unacceptable and fall back to the Secret Service because as the overseer and creator of the plan, you're responsible to make sure anything that you're requesting, especially at a special uh, interest location like that building, that those things are implemented. So if it's possible that a police officer or two were assigned to that building uh, and they didn't show up and they didn't do what was asked and it was identified as a significant threat to the protectee, then that's still a problem. As far as the use of force curriculum, um, it's actually broader for the Secret Service while they're conducting their protective mission. There is no policy in the Secret Service while conducting protection that says you have to wait to be fired upon first. Um, that's absolute nonsense. So mm -hmm. you have free reign to do what's needed if there's an identifiable threat. Um, so that goes back to the communication as to whether or not permission was sought. I don't know about that. However, there needn't be permission sought. If there was a threat, an imminent threat that was identified, the counter snipers are clear to take that out. Are and the mitigate counter snipers, John, like Chuck, do you think that the counter sniper, you know, the one that we've continued to see on the top of the other rooftop, maybe my team can lay in some graphics here and some videos so we can see what we're talking about. Um, was that a Secret Service guy or was that a Pennsylvania guy? It was a hybrid. Um, you had you had two special operations teams there. You had the counter snipers that you see, and then you have the counter assault team. 
that you saw come to the stage heavily armored with the helmets on. That was also a hybrid. So what you have is a secret service component. You had a two-man team on the counter assault team. You had a split two-man team on the counter sniper team, and they were supplemented by either local and state uh, law enforcement. So we don't know. The guy who actually shot the shooter, we don't know whether that was a federal agent or a local agent. We don't. Oh, and you know, that's a little bit old, that chart. That chart's a couple of months old. And if you uh, want to really see something that said, take a look at what happened. Oh, shit. Mm. And we don't know why he didn't shoot him prior to the shooter beginning his shots. We don't. Go ahead, John. saying he's got his finger in the air. What? Yeah. Well, it's again, helping to deconstruct these these two uh, terrible narratives that are out there. You know, right now, the biggest thing that we have to fight is is this uh, terribly destructive idea that there was conspiracy or that law enforcement at any level was waiting to seek permission to engage a threat or, or something uh, like that. Chuck alluded to it earlier or, or flatly said it. The problem with these interagency operations almost always comes down to unreliable intraoperative communication. So uh, I am revealing no source known only to me. I am I am betraying no confidence from people uh, on the scene who have spoken to me, of which there have been several who have been students of mine over the years who are in that factual job uh, and were there. I'm betraying nothing. Uh, this morning, Secret Service has already, in a polite way, introduced the idea that there's a local law enforcement failure that contributed to this. One of the local chief law enforcement officers already revealed these, these issues um, that uh, the counter snipers assigned to the building probably saw the shooter access the roof but weren't able to do anything about it that they contacted patrol on the ground. And, you know, this has already been revealed by one of the local chief law enforcement officers is that one patrol officer was forced to heft another officer from a position to access the roof to see the shooter. And before that officer could engage the shooter, he fell. There, there was oh, no ladder man. involved. So so that's already been revealed and out in the media. And we know that's the case. It's just what Chuck was talking about, the, the communication problems between these agencies that are kind of thrown together. Uh, uh, it's very difficult. So what I saw of the videos of the counter sniper who successfully identified and very, very rapidly engaged the shooter was that he didn't have uh, audio communication to guide him onto the threat. You see him take his eye out of the optic to get visual yeah. access to the scene and then get back on the optic and immediately drove that optic to the threat. And, you know, as evidenced by the audio, the shooter unfortunately got any shots off but the threat was eliminated by that counter sniper as fast or faster than any other human could have ever done. It was, the problem it was, was amazing. Was, Keep going. Yes. The problem was with the interoperative communication and having those counter sniper teams aware of the fact that there was a threat on the roof. And, and the other thing that probably, and many of us have been in that experience before, the other thing that likely added to a delay was the counter snipers knew that at the factory building that that's being occupied by good guys, by another counter sniper team. And there was most likely a delay that was due to what we would call deconfliction, right? It takes some amount of time to visually acquire what you're trying to find, to process it and say, 
hey, who's on the roof? Is that a bad guy or is that a good guy? And that yeah. deconfliction and that extra amount of time, uh, you know, was a they didn't human have and a systems error, you know, very much a systems error that, you know, it, it when we look at failure of multi-agency operations uh, and critical incident failures in law enforcement, the, the inability to have good interoperative communication between the different elements is always a leading cause always that's identified okay. in the after action. Uh, I want Chuck, to tell the audience agree? this. Um, Am I wrong on that? Hold, no, stand by, stand by. I want to, I want to tell you the, the report to which John is referring. Um, the local Pennsylvania sheriff defended the armed officer who encountered the would-be Trump assassin on the rooftop moments before the shooting, claiming it was the right call to retreat after the gunman pointed the weapon at him. Butler County Sheriff Michael Sloop confirmed Monday that a local officer made contact with Crooks after being hoisted up to the roof by another officer, but fled when the sniper pointed his AR-style assault rifle at the officer. Quote, I would have done the same thing. Absolutely, said the sheriff. Quote, all I know is the officer had both hands on the roof to get up on the roof, never made it because the shooter had turned toward the officer and rightfully and smartly the officer let go. So was being hoisted, got a gun pointed at him, let go to save his own life. And then the shooting proceeded uh, by the bad guy as follows, as, as we all saw. Why are you shaking your head? No, John. Well, that, I mean, that's very accurate. But at the heart of all of this, the root cause is a uh, very inadequate assets being yes. dedicated no, to I get President it. I get Trump it. and the campaign. That is I get the it. basic I get it. And that, that's where I want to take the it. discussion now. So let me go with, with you on that, Chuck, because you mentioned it. And I we've got to we've got to look at the head of the Secret Service and this. I, I'm, yeah. Look, I have absolutely no pardon for the female Secret Service officers who looked incompetent. They looked incompetent in the video that we've all seen. Um, not necessarily on the stage. The one woman there seemed to be doing her best to protect him, just like the male agents, but she was too short. But however, when they were bringing the president over to the vehicle, the secure vehicle to get him away, it, it looked like it would look like a bunch of sorority sisters who were hung over. One with the ponytail whipping around. She didn't know where she was going. The other one who couldn't reholster her weapon. Um, not, not one of these women inspires any confidence. And by the way, if they're 30 years old, it would be a lot. I mean, they seem very young. And they don't seem in control or command at all. Look at this woman. She doesn't know what she's doing. She's got to, she gets her sunglasses back. Okay, great. Um, this woman on the left looks like the one who was crouching earlier, though I can't say it for a fact. How, okay, but, and I want to talk about the diversity effort. But before we go there, Chuck, the whole weekend, all I could think of was, fine, let's have that discussion, but let's first talk about who didn't secure the scene. The person who didn't make sure the rooftop was adequately secure is the person we need to be talking about. And I have no idea whether that's a female or a male. Do we know any, anything about who that is? We don't. You're referring to what's called, who was the site agent who did the protective advance ahead of time and who was there to run the show the day of. We don't know who that person was, the level of experience, the gender. We don't know any of that. Um, I can continue here with the DEI program, if you'd like. Yeah. Um, yeah. The director of the Secret Service, Kim Cheadle, uh, has created a program known within the Secret Service as the 30 for 30. Uh, that is the director wants to achieve 30 percent female agents and officers within the Secret Service by the year 2030. This program has created great contention within the Secret Service. And some of the questions that are going to be asked of the director is have standards for hiring, for training, for assignments been lowered to achieve this program? It's a very straightforward question. And now the director is in a position where she's going to have to prove that it hasn't. And I hope it hasn't. But unfortunately, I don't think Speaking honestly, that's going to be the answer. To expand hiring, they're aiming to have 30% women recruits by 2030 and even allowed YouTube influencer Michelle Carey to train with agents. But I'm very conscious uh, as, uh, as I sit in this chair now of making sure that we need to 
uh, attract diverse candidates and ensure that we are developing and giving opportunities to everybody in our workforce, um, and particularly women. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it looks obvious. It's so absurd to try to paint this as female empowerment. Is it female empowerment to take a bunch of women who are obviously unqualified for the job and let them publicly humiliate themselves and endanger the lives of a president and his fans? Is that female empowerment? That's a national embarrassment for womankind. No one gets uplifted by such a de decision, whether it's on a Secret Service detail or a Boeing plane. Diversity, equity, inclusion have no place in jobs that relate to safety and security. And frankly, they have no place anywhere, but certainly not in those jobs, not in an OR, not in a cockpit, and not in front of the president's protective detail. It's deeply wrong. Look, I used to live in Arlington, and there was a woman in my whatever, townhouse unit, who was about six foot two and strong. She was built and she was a secret service agent. And I remember thinking, eh, like that kind of makes some sense to me. I could see that as long as she's weapons trained and she can do all the other stuff. And then you get the occasional female firefighter who matches the, that description too. But it's what, less than one half of 1%. Those are the only ones who should even be considered. And the, you know, the, the, the women who look like me, who are, you know, on the smaller side and could easily be run over by a five foot seven male have no business being there, Chuck. This wasn't necessary. I've worked with females my entire career and the females that I worked with were fantastic. They were as trained as I was, as capable as I was, uh, both physically and with a firearm. Uh, and there was great comfort and trust when you were serving on protection details of which I served on many. So, you know, to divide the agency like this uh, has not been helpful, uh, but this is where the director has focused uh, since her time as director. And I think that's gonna come up because I don't think the priority of this director's attention has been placed where it needs to be. And that is getting the most qualified people into the agency and focusing on the operations of the agency, which is a no fail mission. You gotta show up to work and get it right 100% of the time, each and every day. Uh, the Secret Service is not the type of agency that needs to be kinder, gentler, and softer. That's, that's, not, it. that's not it. That's not what the Secret Service does each and every day. Uh, what you wanted to see with former President Trump being taken off that stage I can appreciate the visual of the fist raised in the air, but if I'm there, his feet don't touch the ground. Yeah. He loses all say on being evacuated from that very dangerous situation. And unfortunately, I fear when it's looked at that the answer was that they were incapable of doing so because they had incapable people around them. Mm -hmm. He talked uh, today to the New York Post and um, Byron York about the fact that he, you hear him in the tape saying, where are my shoes, get my shoes. And he said he was hit so hard by the Secret Service, he was hit right out of his shoes. He was wearing yeah. shoes when he began the speech, but then they they listened to him when he said, wait, wait. Right. And I see, I take your point. And in that particular moment, they should be in charge, not him, because they knew that they had shot the one sniper, but they didn't know How Chuck whether there was another sniper. How many more? The assumption is always there's more. The assumption is it could be a diversionary uh, attack. It could be split tactics. It could be everything. So so the assumption is you get them up uh, as soon as you can. You get notified the threat's down. At least the identified threat is down. And you move them. You get them out of there. Forget the shoes. Forget stopping to reassure the audience. Uh, I get it. But at that point in time, it becomes my show and we're moving. It could, it could have taken a moment where he dodged a bullet, all but dodged a bullet, and turned it into a situation where he actually did take a bullet. I mean, I see the danger. Yeah. Um, I've got yeah. to ask you about resources because, again, this is only from this one reporter who you guys are both saying does not have her facts right about shooter protocol, sniper protocol, that absolutely the Secret yeah. Service can shoot Wrong. any threat without being Wrong. shot upon. Um, but she also did report, and it's gotten a lot of traction online, 
that one of the reasons there may not have been appropriate resources for President Trump there was because, and, and she is sourcing two sources within the Secret Service community, um, saying the only permanent agent from Trump's detail during the rally was special agent in charge Kern, um, and that all others were temps. Pittsburgh U.S. Secret Service field office had a Jill Biden visit and designated a lot of resources to her, according to at least one of her sources. She says the advance work only occurred one day beforehand because of a lack of resources. Where were the resources? It was the Jill Biden visit. Let me get your reaction to that first, Chuck. Is that is that possible? Right now, the Secret Service is denying that on the record, saying that is not true, that she's, she's wrong on that as well. Yeah, I got to tell you, it's not uncommon to have more than just one visit uh, fall under a uh, geographic area controlled by the same field office. Uh, the Secret Service historically has been able to walk and chew gum uh, regarding resources, even if they needed to fly them in. Um, so I don't know why that would have been the problem. I think they would have been both adequately staffed and, and the capability was there from a resourcing standpoint, for sure. Um, so I, I can't comment on that. Uh, I can tell you that it doesn't surprise me. It does not surprise me, sorry, that they're both, um, that they are both uh, having to be staffed significantly. One's the first lady and, and one is the former president and the presumptive nominee for the Republican party. So they're both pretty high level. Yes, what do you make of that report, John? I you know, I, I don't know whether it's true, but she's also in there reporting that the, the, many of the those working around President Trump were temps, were, I, I don't know what that really means within this context. Well, DHS Secretary Mayorkas is providing the same level of protection to President Trump that he's providing to the border. Um, <laughs> you know, I'm not the expert that Chuck is on, on dignitary protection, but a basic principle of body bunker as a tactic, putting yourself around the principle to shield them with your body from any ballistic threat, a basic requirement for that technique is that the people providing the body bunker are as big or bigger than the principle to provide them the protection. And exactly what you pointed out, Megan, what you're seeing is just the prima facie evidence that Trump has been assigned the B team or or less. Mm -hmm. You know, the last time we had a situation like this, I believe Teddy Roosevelt was president um, running for reelection as a former president. And the same thing happened. He was almost killed by an assassin. I, I don't need a I don't need Chuck's background to know that woman was too small to be protecting Donald Trump. It, it's obvious. Uh, there's no offense. I, I actually don't give a shit if she's offended or not. She's too small. She's not the right person for the job. Doesn't mean she can't be behind the scenes doing tactical planning in an office. That's, I don't care about that. But same with, with firefighters, you know, and then we've seen this in the New York City police officers who, you know, we saw so dancing like that. Many of these women are obese. Many of the men are obese too, but men have a natural advantage of strength when it comes to to their female counterparts. It's just, we've crossed the Rubicon into a lack of safety for civilians, and in this case, a former president, in the name of equity, and it's disgusting. I hope this is part of the beginning of the end. Chuck, um, I do wonder about the Dan Bongino reporting, because he is definitely in a position to know. He's got a lot of Secret Service contacts still, and he was on body protection yes. for Obama. And he's mm -hmm. reporting and sticking very certainly Two, his reporting that um, the agency officials, and I think this means the Secret Service officials, denied requests for more security from Secret Service supervisors on Trump's protective detail. So I, it's either DHS he's talking about or senior Secret Service, but that, yeah. that C Secret Service supervisors wanted more protection for Trump and that it was denied. This spokesman for the Secret Service, Anthony Guglielini, Mm -hmm. denied that such a request and denial took place. Though I will tell you, I, as a lawyer, I noticed some wiggle room in his answer. He says, that's an untrue assertion that a member of the former president's team requested additional security resources. All right, so he's saying that a member of the former president's team and that those were rebuffed. And then he says, 
In fact, we added protective resources and technology and capabilities as part of an increased campaign travel tempo. I don't know whether that means agents or whether he can just say, you know, we had to give him a few more laptops and guns. Right. You know, what, right. what do you, what's going on here? Yeah, very, uh, very gray statement. Uh, you know, I can tell you that the, the emails, uh, once they're requested, which they will be, uh, from places like the Office of Protective Operations uh, are going to show whether or not requests were made and if they were denied and what those requests were. Um, former President Trump, as we know, is a very high profile person by nature. Um, and along with that profile comes an increased threat level. That's just the way it is. The more vocal you are, the more people don't like you. That's just the way it is. And the Secret Service has to pay attention to that and adapt. So if there were requests made and they were denied, uh, this is not going to help uh, with the general theme of what happened. Will these congressional investigations, uh, House Oversight, House Intel, and forgive me, I can't remember the committee in the Senate, but also the Senate, which is controlled by Democrats. I mean, it's kind of interesting that they too have said, we've got to investigate what went wrong here. I don't know that I trust the Secret Service to investigate itself, but do you believe these congressional investigations will get to the bottom of this, Chuck? I mean, I'm, I don't know why Kim Cheadle hasn't tendered her resignation already. Yeah, you know, there's all there's also a uh, request now coming out of Congress for uh, an independent commission uh, to look at this, similar to the Warren Commission. So uh, I think there's going to be a lot of developments here. I think that type of request would be very hard for Democrats to push away. I think this needs to be a bipartisan issue. Uh, and I think this is a good way for agencies like the FBI and others to say, let us do our work. We'll present you with our findings, uh, and then you can take those into consideration. But as far as the Secret Service doing an investigation of itself right now, uh, I, I think it doesn't matter. I think the only way uh, the Secret Service is reviewed uh, is by independent agencies uh, or outside agencies. Well, and Chuck, let me follow it up with they're kind of underground at the moment. You know, we've had couple pressers now from the they New are. Jersey, sorry, I keep saying New Jersey, it's Pennsylvania, state officials, the sheriff and so on. Secret Service wasn't there. Secret Service held a presser to tell us what they're doing at the RNC. P.S. The headline is they're not increasing security. They feel it's already adequately covered. They haven't spoken. Mm -hmm. I mean, they, I, I'm not sure this is the kind of thing where it's like you got caught having an affair when you were up for a cabinet position. Just go underground and say nothing. This is not one of those events. So what do you make of their yeah. utter silence right now? Oh, I've said from the start, I think it's a strategic error. I think you've got to come out and you've got to face the music. Um, you've got the line that there is an ongoing investigation. Uh, but I think the media and the American public just want to be reassured uh, that former President Trump is being protected the way he needs to be protected. Um, I think you can talk about that, maybe not in totality, but I think you can come out and reassure the American public that, yes, everything that's, that needs to be done is being done. Uh, acknowledge that there was a failure in the overall security plan. There's no running away from that. I think you get that over with. You take the hit from a PR standpoint. You say there's ongoing investigations. You can't comment too, more on, too much more on that. And then you reassure the American public that everything's been fixed. Uh, and he's going to have the highest level of protection along with everybody else that the Secret Service protects. I don't know why they're burying their heads in the sand. Trump today, just today, is calling for RFKJ to receive Secret Service protection, too. And yeah. if Joe Biden denies that now, I mean, he's just absolutely heartless. He's going to have to provide it. This is just yeah. too hot a political culture at the moment. You guys have been wonderful. Thank you for educating us both and giving us so much of your time. Chuck, John, all the best to you. Thank you, Megan. A pleasure. Wow. On any other day, we would have given all two hours to the EJs, who are two of our favorite guests. Only on, on a day like this do we only manage to squeeze in a bit with them. But you guys are with me on this crazy news cycle and how incredible it's been. Um, there's a lot to go over. They're going to stay late, so we'll do one of those shows where 
we do a bit for the live for the Sirius XM audience and then we'll continue it. But uh, God bless all of you for, for wa wading through these waters with us. We'll be right back. Do you ever think, how can I work this hard and still be in debt? The piles of overdue bills, the threatening phone calls, never having money to do anything. If you are trapped in debt, done with debt can be a way out. They have developed aggressive new strategies to end your debt permanently. Done with debt stands between you and the harassing, annoying bill collectors. Who wants to deal with them? They tirelessly negotiate with your creditors to lower or even forgive what you may owe. And they do it all without bankruptcy or new loans. One client said one phone call saved us a fortune. I only wish we'd done this long ago. Done with Debt has unique strategies to get you out of debt faster and put more money in your pocket every month. But you need to hurry because some debt solutions are time sensitive and you don't want to miss out. Visit donewithdebt.com. Talk with one of their debt relief strategists for free. What do you have to lose except your debt? Go to donewithdebt.com. That's donewithdebt.com. After an historic news weekend here in America, the media has proven itself to be incompetent yet again. That's one word for it. Corrupt, biased is another, are two others. A stunning headline from the front page of the Denver Post declared, gunman dies in attack. What in the actual F? When we first saw this headline circulating, we thought it was a joke, but it's real. That's how they're describing an attempted presidential assassination. And the New York Times at first went with Trump hurt, but safe after a shooting. You know, like he was just, you know, it was a drive-by, like he was in, on the south side of Chicago. <laughs> no, there was no mention of an assassination attempt. Then there's Forbes for the W, who in a now deleted article asked Reader Sunday, will surviving gunfire be Donald Trump's next appeal to black voters? It was from a DEI writer. That's their beat. Everything must be seen be be through the DEI perspective. Here to discuss it all and more, two of our favorites best known on the show as the EJs, Eliana Johnson, editor-in-chief of the Washington Free Beacon and co-host of the podcast Ink Stained Wretches, with Emily Jaschinski as well. She's DC correspondent for Unheard. Ladies, welcome back to the show. Eliana, I know you got, your time is short. Um, the media, I pointed out the heroic behavior of, for example, the New York Times photographer who continued to press the shutter despite grave danger all around him and got us these iconic photos. But the print journalists who actually have to write copy, different story. It's amazing. Um, you know, we I spent part of the weekend writing an editorial about this, trying to process this and thinking about the role of the press, which in uh, past shootings, whether it was um, the 2021 shooting at a spa in Georgia, the media jumped to tell us this was symptomatic of right wing anti Asian hate or Sarah Palin's use of a crosshairs imagery on a map um, that was attributed where they said when Congresswoman Gabrielle Giffords was shot that Palin was responsible for this. Um, you know, I have no doubt that if it was an assassination attempt on Biden, that we'd be hearing how the rights rhetoric was responsible for this. But instead, we're, we're not getting that in the news coverage. And the other interesting thing about this is I think there's no institution in American life that's done more to empower Trump or help his rise and now resurrection uh, then the media um, in the belief that he's the weakest Republican standard bearer and Trump um, showed in his response to this how how foolish that that is, because he really did show grace under fire. Can you believe the fact that MSNBC took Joe Scarborough off the air this morning? His show did not air reportedly because they're so worried that he or one of his panelists will say something incendiary about Trump, who's still recovering from this attempted assassination. The network, once that hit, pushed back saying, oh no, we're just in rolling breaking news coverage. Well, why, what's wrong with him? He can't do rolling, but you have lots of reporters who can go on his show. They don't trust him because they know he's hashtag part of the problem, Eliana. It is, look, Credit to the management of M of NBC and MSNBC that um, had a moment of sanity here because they're right. Um, I think it's true that either one of the two hosts of that show, Joe Scarborough or, or Mika Brzezinski, or one of their many, many guests uh, would have said something that would have tarnished the reputation of NBC or MSNBC. Um, and 
and their flagship show. But it is incredible that they have to pull that show from the air because they can't trust what the people are going to say to talk about major political news, which is their job. Right. Newsflash, I think you better have a talk with Jen Psaki, too, who was on Meet the Press over the weekend, talking about how scared she is about the journalists here and how we really need, you know, President Biden to be a healer. Okay. President Biden is also hashtag part of the problem. And yes, it's fine to worry about journalists in general. But in this particular instance, the person in danger is Donald Trump, Jen Psaki, not random journalists. It's just absurd the way they approach these stories. So, Eliana, as we go into this news cycle this week with the RNC and we have a, a more unified type candidate, that's the way Trump is thinking. Do you think the media will respond accordingly by softening its coverage of him? I think the coverage will be a bit softer, but it's also turned softer on Biden, um, where you see there is no more talk of pushing Biden off the ticket. But I do think it's going to be difficult for them to go into this convention and be vicious and nasty, which is what every bone in their body is is, uh, is telling them they want to do. Look, everything right now is coming up Trump. Um starting with his response and the photographs captured of that attempt, which are historic, um, and ending with this morning with the dismissal of the document case, the decision by Judge Eileen Cannon down there. Um, and so things continue to move in his direction. And I do think the, co the media coverage will be less uh, vicious and nasty because of it. We'll continue to have losers like Keith Olbermann. I'll tell you in the next block what he's saying. Emily, thank you for sticking around. There's so much to cover. Very grateful to have you. And I'm sorry that it took us two hours to get to you. I said to the audience, any other day, you'd be the whole show as you always are. But my God, you understand today, very extraordinary afternoon. Well, and it was such fascinating content, listening to people with knowledge of what happens inside the Secret Service and people who law enforcement tasked with protecting the president. So it was uh, riveting to even just listen to. Thank you. And it's interesting because that guy, John, too, well, while he was very careful about not disclosing exactly what his knowledge was based on. He's very well connected uh, to all the players in this case. So I, we were grateful to have him as well. Um, sh so here's how I see the news today. All right. You've got, okay. You've got president Trump surviving an assassination attempt and creating one of the most iconic photos and moments of all time, leading even some Democrats to say, I got to vote for that guy. I, there's no, like, that is a superhuman kind of strength that we all witnessed there. You can have that guy, or you can have the guy who falls up the stairs trying to get onto Air Force One, who can't keep his words together, who can't spit sentences out, who has to go to bed at eight, who can only work four to six hours a day. I mean, truly, like the contrast could not be more stark. And then he comes into today with the RNC about to, you know, get going. It's going to be a celebration of Donald Trump and finds out that the most problematic of the four legal cases against him is done. It's dead, at least for now and probably forever. Um, and that that could also affect Jack Smith's role in what's left of the January 6th case, which was already on life support. Today, in just a matter of moments, he's going to be announcing his vice presidential pick, which will imbue the campaign with another round of enthusiasm, not from the media, not from the left, but from Republicans, no matter who it is, some will be a little disappointed, some will be excited, but net net, these things tend to have a positive uplifting effect. And against all that, what you have on the Democratic side is President Biden, before the Trump shooting, holding a conference call with angry House Democrats who are saying, get out, we, we can't win with you. And reportedly so inept on this call that <laughs> I'm going to re repeat what Jake Sherman of Punchbowl News reported. During the call with the Pro Progressive Caucus, the president said, said out loud that his staff had passed him a note to, quote, stay positive. You are sounding defensive. Biden read the note aloud to participants on the call. I'm sorry. And then last night from the Oval, he got out there and tried to strike this conciliatory tone. Let's go for unity and continued to screw up his words instead of saying, We'll decide our differences at the ballot box, repeatedly said at the battle box and the transcription person at the white one. There's just and, and here's the end of my synopsis. Now there's reporting via Axios that some of the top senior leadership among the Dems who were most rabid about getting Biden out have resigned themselves to the reality in their view 
that Donald Trump just won this election, that he's going to get a second term, and that there's really no point in expending any more further political capital in trying to get Biden out because the conclusion here in their view is foregone. I mean, it's they know what it's going to be. So what do you make of this chain of events and where it leaves us? It's just it's just such a knot to untangle, but it's really the most uh, remarkable state of affairs, I think, in modern American political history. It's crazier than 2016, the night that Donald Trump actually won the election. I think right now we're in a moment that's actually even crazier than that, because as you just laid out, Megan, the sitting president of the United States had a cognitive breakdown in front of the entire country. The last two weeks have been spent with donors actually revoking, saying they are not giving more money to the Democratic Party party. You have high profile Hollywood stars, uh, Democratic lawmakers saying that they can no longer support the sitting president of the United States, not because of policy differences, but because he is too old. He is not capable of handling his duties. And then on top of that, uh, you have this historic moment, as you just laid out, Megan, of the former president of the United States getting shot in the head just grazing his ear, uh, ear, obviously, but being millimeters away from death on national television at a campaign event. Um, and all of this is playing out as that former president goes into the pomp and the circumstance of the nominating convention. And so just psychologically, Megan, I'm trying to imagine what it's like to be Donald Trump right now. You survive by millimeters in front of the entire world. A bullet actually hits your ear. Those iconic photographs are snapped. And then you head into Milwaukee with a huge legal weight just about off your shoulders, a vice presidential announcement to make. And Donald Trump obviously revels in this type of pomp and circumstance. Mm -hmm. And then you're being coronated as the Republican nominee. I mean, it, you have to imagine that the trauma almost has him, uh, you know, going back and forth, oscillating between uh, the, the, the trauma of that and the stress that it can put on your life, but also kind of walking on air with all of yeah. this politically, personally laid out in front of him this week. I was, I've been thinking about that picture we just showed with the fist up in the air, this iconic picture with the flag overhead and the Secret Service trying to get him off stage, the blood on his face. And I think Donald Trump's whole life in a way prepared him for this moment. You know, he hmm. is incredibly strong. He is a fighter. In the fight or flight contest, fight always wins with Donald Trump. And it's, of course, made him controversial. I mean, I have been on the receiving end of some of that myself, and it can be somewhat alarming for those who find themselves on the wrong side of him. But net net, it's what made him president. It's what made him, you know, incredibly rich and successful. It's what made him not roll over and, you know, get into the fetal position when he got indicted four times. It's what made him an effective president. It's what made him stand behind Brett Kavanaugh when no other sitting president would have stood by that guy being accused of being a serial rapist by these loons who we didn't necessarily know were all loons at the time. Donald Trump didn't care. He stood by his nominee and he got him onto the bench. All of it. And it's what made him able in that moment to raise the fist. Not only that, but he's a natural born performer. He, he hosted the number one show on television for a decade. He's really talented in front of the camera, has a natural showman's instinct for what works. I've told the audience before, he always sits down in an interview and says, the lighting's like this, what about this? There's a shadow here, move that. He understands, almost like a reality show would, that there's a camera on him at all times and that it matters how he behaves. And on top of that, Emily, you've got his connection with the UFC. And before that, the WWE, you know, he loves going to these events where it's raucous and it's rowdy and it's rough and going into the ring, you know, pretending he's in the fights himself, the showmanship of that and what people like to see in a in a battle, you know, a physical battle where people could actually, you know, throw blows and all that. So he's sort of got a lifetime of being around conflict and understanding how to own the moment. I just think all of this fed into this extraordinary thing we saw where actually under fire, he was able to maintain his composure, his strength, his messaging to the people, raise his fist in defiance and say, fight. 
The WWE point is fascinating. And on top of that, I just want to add what a lot of people have already heard on the audio that was being picked up by the presidential mic that was still on after Donald Trump uh, and the bullets were flying by him, flying towards his ear and all of that. You heard him say, let me get my shoes. And many people have pointed that out at this point. But I think it was a very, very conscious effort on Trump's behalf to uh, understand he had cameras unrolling right in front of him. He turned to the crowd very intentionally. He didn't just mouth fight into the Secret Service people's face, uh, into their heads as they were covering him. He intentionally sort of, you can see this, uh, maneuvers himself so that he's looking out at the crowd and saying, fight. He wanted to have those shoes on. He told Byron York after Byron said, it looked like you wanted to keep speaking. He said, yeah, I did, <laughs> that Byron had picked up on something accurate. Uh, and that's no surprise. And that's when you met, mentioned the WWE UFC point, that really, uh, I think the, the images of somebody with blood streaked across their face and a fist up in the air the parallel is it's almost eerie megan mm -hmm. um, but it, it was very much donald trump knowing that he had cameras on him uh, that there were video cameras and that there were actual cameras and uh, it's it's reality television and the, the last point i would make is that he's extended the reality television onto truth social as well um he he's been reacting uh, like we we see people who are in the public eye do, not presidents so much, but he's been reacting, dictating through reporting we know. He's been dictating his truth social posts about all of this. He posted one not long after the shooting, a couple of the next day, just kind of bringing people into his mindset like he typically does. Sometimes it gets him in trouble. Right. Sometimes it works really well for him. But in this case, I think it's been working well for him because it's it's inviting people into the moment with him. It, it matters. You know, we... I've heard Charles C.W. Cook, who I love over at National Review, not a Trump fan, say many times fairly that in some ways Donald Trump might not be the most effective spokesman for America. In some ways, he can't go in depth on our historical importance and our founding fathers. And all. I mean, I, if he can, I've never seen it. So I, I understand the point. But he gets the visual and the strength of our country and how that should be portrayed in our commander in chief better than anyone. And that matters too, especially because the other choice couldn't be weaker, both physically and cognitively. And just in his presentation, you know, you have the chance to send this guy bloodied up with the fist in the air to go stand up to Xi and Putin if necessary, or you've got the other guy who, I mean, truly is only working a smattering of hours, needs to go night, night by eight, and is at the point now where his own staff is referring to his big boy press conferences, because this one he's actually going to take questions off prompter. That's just, one is provocative and one is scary to our adversaries. It's I, it, the, the, the choice could not be more clear. I can't wait to see the polls, to see how this event has affected people who were on the fence, right? That small group that we all said, well, they're not gonna go, they're not gonna vote for Trump now. By now they know Trump, you know, he's got a ceiling or, or does he? Yeah, and Biden is clearly trying to get himself in front of camera. And I think that's his only choice given that his uh, sort of dominant um, characteristic right now as people perceive him is weakness, is frailty. He wants to project this image of leadership that he's on top of the situation. We saw those photographs actually from the Situation Room released after he was briefed with Vice President Harris. And that's what he's trying to do. And I think that's really his only choice. At the same time, though, he can't get through an Oval Office address without saying battle box um, without saying former Trump instead of former President Trump. So it might not be serving him well because it continues to emphasize the split screen. I don't know if you've seen this meme that's pinging around, Megan, but it has Joe Biden versus stairs. It's a picture of Joe Biden falling down. And then next to it is a picture that says Donald Trump versus bullet of a picture of him standing up with his fist in the air. Uh, that's stuff that's pinging around TikTok and the memosphere and pop culture world is going to be really powerful, I suspect, uh, like you do, that it's going to show up in the numbers. And Joe Biden doesn't have any other choice. There's nothing he can do to mitigate that going forward. And the RNC mm -mm. has been, in this sort of Trumpian way, 
uh, prepared for the moment that Donald Trump now is going to take advantage of. It's in Milwaukee. Uh, again, I'm, I'm from not far from Milwaukee. This is intentionally chosen, brilliant, brilliantly chosen for Republicans. We can't take for granted how smart of a choice it was to hold this convention in Milwaukee. He has the Teamsters president speaking. He has the mayor of East Palestine, Ohio speaking. Uh, and they also remember even in Butler, Pennsylvania, they were at a farm show that's where he did this rally. I mean, it's it's really fascinating how the Republican messaging is now draped in ways that we've come accustomed to with these trappings of Trumpism uh, that are now, they've set the stage for something really powerful, quite literally set the stage. Mm-hmm. The, uh, just a dip into v- vice presidential news. I hate to spend too much time on it because by the time our podcast hits, people will know who it actually is. But um, right now, CNBC reporting it's not Rubio. And there was an earlier report that no one knew that all the, all the last like finalists were saying as of uh, up until today that not not one had heard whether they were the choice or not. I don't know if that's true, but if so, I it's think like it's you, Megan. I think in that reverse. can only mean one thing. It's, it's you. It's Trump Kelly 24. <laughs> <laughs> I got enough problems. I don't need to add that to the list. Um, here, I, you mentioned Biden last night, and I do need to play some of that because he attempted to, you know, be the sober leader from the Oval Office. There were first reports that he was going to put this on tape, that he couldn't even do a two minute address from the Oval Office live. And um, then we heard, no, oh, no, he's going to do it live. And I, I got to tell you, like, I have my doubts on whether he had originally planned on doing it live, but whatever. He did it live. He did screw up his words. And here was the message. All right, now he got a lot of praise for this message, but I've got a different take on it. Watch. I want to speak to you tonight about the need for us to lower the temperature in our politics. Tonight, I want to speak to what we do know. A former president was shot, an American citizen killed, while simply exercising his freedom to support the candidate of his choosing. Violence has never been the answer. Whether it's with members of Congress of both parties being targeted and shot, or a violent mob attacking the Capitol on January 6th, or a brutal attack on the spouse of former Speaker of the House, Nancy Pelosi, or information and intimidation on election officials, or the kidnapping plot against the sitting governor, or an attempted assassination on Donald Trump. And in America, we resolve our difference at the battle box. You know, that's how we do it, at the battle box, not with bullets. The power to change America should always rest in the hands of the people, not in the hands of a would-be assassin. Okay, first of all, the need to both sides, the attempted assassination of a former president is abhorrent. This is in a category of its own and does not deserve to be mentioned in the same breath as what happened to Nancy Pelosi's husband out in San Francisco with some deranged druggie or the plot against Gretchen Whitmer, which we know involved an unhealthy amount of his federal agents trying to lure people into threatening Gretchen Gretchen Whitmer Um, or January 6th. If you're going to go January 6th, why don't you mention BLM and all the riots they held, right? Like a presidential attempted assassination is in a league of its own. And he knows that. So the attempt to both sides it is repulsive. And not only that, Emily, but the nerve for him to say, we're going to, we really need to lower the temperature as it's his DOJ that is prosecuting Donald Trump in not one, but two federal cases, one of which just got dismissed this morning. No, thanks to him. He didn't say, and therefore I am withdrawing the lawfare against Donald Trump. And after the past just few days since his non compass mentis performance at that debate, when he started to go in a downward spiral and panic, the rhetoric he's been using against Trump has gotten more severe, pointed, and problematic than ever. Here's just some of what we've heard from Joe Biden recently. Donald Trump is a, Donald Trump is a convicted criminal. Yeah. Donald Trump was found liable for sexual assault. Here's what the judge wrote, quote, Mr. Trump raped her. No, 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 I mean, it's the judge's language, not mine. Donald Trump and the MAGA Republicans 
represent an extremism that threatens the very foundations of our republic. But there's no question that the Republican the Party today is dominated, driven, and intimidated by Donald Trump and the MAGA Republicans. And that is a threat to this country. And then, of course, saying we need to put a, him in a bullseye. I'm like, spare me the lower the temperature talk until you do it yourself. And, you know, it's not just Joe Biden either. And at a moment of political violence against the right, the right thing to do, the morally correct thing to do is give that its moment. We know that's what the left would be demanding if the parties were reversed here. And I think actually that's correct. I think it is correct. It's not to say that there isn't uh, culpability for extreme rhetoric, quote, on both sides. Uh, I think we all know that our, our political rhetoric is at a, a high level right now. We're, we're all well aware of that. But when it happens against the right, against a former president, against the nominee for the Republican Party, maybe pause. I mean, I thought that was shockingly tasteless to invoke uh, acts of violence against the political left or attempted acts of violence against the political left at a moment where a man was slain slaughtered in the bleachers, his blood bleachers, his blood is smeared over the bleachers because he went to a Trump rally in rural Pennsylvania. To even think, to even think, as Wolf Blitzer and Margaret Brennan, uh, both mainstream media figures, in addition to the president who made those invocations in his Oval Office speech, shockingly tasteless. If it were reversed, the media would be calling their own out for it. They'd be calling Joe Biden out for it. And frankly, they would be right they would be right to do that. They're not playing by their own rules, uh, but you know that's not something we can come to expect from them. Uh, it's just a matter of how Biden handles this going forward because his his campaign is predicated on the idea that Donald Trump is a threat to democracy. Uh, and now a lot of people on the left are, are saying, take the temperature down. Well, you know, can you make the argument that he's a threat to democracy while also making the argument the temperature needs to go down? Maybe, we certainly haven't seen them attempt it yet so far. I'm really looking forward to Margaret Brennan condemning the New Republic for merging Trump's face into Hitler's and the Washington Post for doing the same. Jeff Bezos was out there condemning this attempted assassination on President Trump. You know, it was so, so sad this shouldn't happen in our country. It was your publication that did the same thing. Trump on one side with a profile right next to Adolf Hitler with their heads merging and said, yes, it really is OK to compare Donald Trump to Hitler. Spare me your empty platitudes in the wake of the man almost being murdered on national television. Who do they think they're kidding? And Margaret Brennan of CBS, who I think, correct me if I'm wrong, but like traditionally has been not the worst offender on this. Like of all the liberal yep. media, she's usually not that bad was the worst. I really think she was absolutely the worst in how she reacted to this. Not only did she have an actual Republican shooting victim, Steve Scalise sitting there, but she insisted that he in specifically instruct members of his party to rein in the rhetoric and, and, and not blame. Like, first of all, Steve Scalise does not control all Republicans magically. And that's the wrong question to be asking him. And then had this exchange with Robert Costa um, on their Saturday night coverage. Watch this, SOT 16. And it should be noted, many of Trump supporters on social media tonight extremely angry. This is still a politically charged moment yes. as much as it is a crime investigation and a security moment. Many people already in this country very angry at the other side, not just on a partisan red versus blue level, but we cover it all the time here at CBS News. There's a visceral nature to the emotions that pour out on the campaign trail. And to that point, Bob Costa, I was just texting with Robert O'Brien, the former national security advisor to Donald Trump, who uh, sent out a statement saying we've got to take the political temperature down. He and Mike Lee, the, the senator, um, issued this jointly. We've got to take the political temperature down as evidenced by what happened in Pennsylvania today. So two key Republican Trump supporters calling for uh, the rhetoric the political violence, the threats of it to be lowered. That is in stark contrast to the head of the Trump campaign, one of the top Trump campaign uh, officials you were reading statements from earlier. Um, we are also looking at social media posts uh, from other uh, Republicans who are quite angry. Well, we're entering, though, a period of extreme political charge with the Republican National Convention. I mean, just talk about getting the focus wrong. That, that was not the story on Saturday night, and it's not the story today.
And maybe stop texting Margaret Brennan. If she treats you like this, <laughs> if she treats people like this, maybe stop texting her. Stop trying to get your name mentioned on national television in the aftermath of a tragedy. I'm not ascribing ill motives. I think it's just honestly a time for, for people to learn that if your former president, the former president of your party is nearly assassinated on international television, and that's the response of somebody in the chair like that in mainstream media, uh, maybe they're not capable of covering you with fairness. And maybe you should think about tactically how you you know respond to that going forward. But I don't know how that's, you know, I, I think it's a big lesson for everybody. I don't know if you remember, Megan, when uh, those pipe bombs, horrible situation, were sent to CNN newsrooms. Um, you know, obviously a terrible incident, uh, much, much uh, smaller scale than what we saw play out on Saturday. And the entire conversation was about how horrible the right is. You weren't allowed to, you know, quote both sides it. And again, I think that's right. When something happens in one direction, it's appropriate to talk about that and to remember that these are people too. But of course, now it's, it's, it's just both sides, both sides, both sides. Those aren't the rules they play by. They're not the rules they demand everybody else play, play by. But now, of course, uh, we can only talk about how it's both sides, not how yeah. the political right has reason has has been demonized in these these ways, which is the story on the night that the political rights leader almost died. That's the story. You yes. want to get into rhetoric uh, while the man is still got it, stitches in his ear or however he recovered from that? Then let's do that. Let's talk about the rhetoric leading up to the assassination attempt. What led to that? That's the story. Not. The anger in response to it and condemning and a man it, died like this moron his family. Yes, exactly right. And and Margaret Brennan was definitely part of the problem. Jamie Gangel, oh my God, at CNN, look at this. I'm so, how clueless can you be? Sat seventeen. I do want to say there was one thing that when I watched the tape, I found odd uh, because of all of the heated rhetoric. And that is that after he was hit, uh, former President Trump got up and said, fight, fight, fight. I think what we're hearing from people is that's not the message that we want to be sending right now. We want to tamp it down. You're an idiot. Exactly wrong on all fronts. It's exactly what we needed to hear. It's what most normal people wanted to hear and were inspired by as one of the most inspirational moments of our lives, of recent history, to see a man under fire like that coming out and saying, I'm okay, and putting his fist in the air and saying, fight, continue fighting for our ideals. What planet does this person live on? How bad is her Trump derangement syndrome that she thinks it was a negative message? Shouldn't we fight what led to a man having to shield his family and sacrifice his own life and have his blood smeared all over those bleachers in the, the Butler Farm Show in Pennsylvania? Shouldn't that be the reaction to anybody? The man was just shot at. Donald Trump was just shot at, pushed to the ground by Secret Service. He stood up. That's fighting in and of itself. Was it, Should he not have done that? I don't know, Megan. I'm curious what you think about uh, whether or not this was in the other direction if people would get suspended for saying things like that. Yeah, they would. Absolutely, they would. But you get a total pass when you're on the left. There's been no, I asked my team this morning, has there been any blowback on the New Republic for that Hitler cover? Have they weighed in at all? Have they have they apologized? So it was only eight or nine days ago. Nothing, absolutely nothing. Um, then you've got Representative Benny Thompson. You saw this, I'm sure, Democrat, Mississippi, who um, he, he offered condolences, you know, so sorry, this is sad, you know, political violence, bad. And um, Benny Johnson, sorry, Thompson, uh, is the same person who tried to pull President Trump's Secret Service protection in light of his conviction as a, a, a in uh, you know being found guilty in, as a felon in New York State. It was called the Disgraced Act, denying infinite security and government resources allocated toward convicted and extremely dishonorable form of Pro Protectees Act. So he can spare me the kind words now, and not just that, but his staffer Jacqueline Marsaw was out there. Uh, she's a field director for him. And uh, she posted on Facebook, I don't condone violence, but please get some shooting lessons so you don't miss next time. Oops, that wasn't me talking. And then in a follow-up post, she wrote, that's what your hate speech got you. So now she's been fired. But what kind of an office is Benny Thompson running where he thinks President Trump should have lost his security 
and he's got staffers like this. Yeah, I was going to say he's running an office that gleefully um, did a media debut for that bill, that piece of legislation. They went across media and just were so smug and, again, gleeful about it. Um, if people go back and, and roll the tapes the way they talked about that bill, uh, it, it would, I mean, again, you would be forced to answer for this with, you know, not just involving firing a staffer who said something insane afterwards, but for your own conduct and your own culpability uh, in, in creating that atmosphere by introducing a bill like that. So, I mean, it just says so much that our, you know, it's, it's kind of too little too late from people like Jeff Bezos, um, because this should have been happening, you know, a week ago, a month ago, a year ago, almost 10 years ago at this point, as we were all reacting to the rise of populism, uh, there was just no grace given to the people who looked at Donald Trump and saw a hero, which is unthinkable to people in coastal newsrooms. I get it. It's unthinkable to people in Hollywood. Uh, but there's just never been any grace. And the reaction has always been counterproductive, even by the left's standards. If you hate populism, stop giving reasons for people to love populism uh, because you are punching down at them relentlessly, relentlessly, mm -hmm. even when their champion is shot in the head. The punching down continues. Two points. Uh, one, because I promised it earlier, Keith Olbermann actually out there over the weekend suggesting Trump wasn't actually shot. Saying the strangest parts of this are 12 hours afterward and no authorities are confirming Trump's assertion that he was shot. And there seem to be few media questions as to why they haven't. What an idiot. Read the news. Confirmed multiple times by the Secret Service, by Trump himself, but he doesn't believe a word that comes out of Trump's mouth. Uh, he can't deal with it. Anything that would make Trump look sympathetic is just rejected. And then there's Jack Black, emblematic of many people in Hollywood, who just like that staffer for Thompson, got on stage at an event that he was playing uh, for his band this weekend and said this. Don't miss Trump next time. <laughs> Don't miss Trump next time to the laughter of, I guess, his Canadian crowd. They, their big lamentation today is not the rhetoric of the left, the president, never mind the right. It's that the shooter missed, which takes us where, Emily, in the, in the call to unify and lower the temperature. I mean, it, it's just the, the Keith Olbermann, just starting with him, um, there was also an advisor to Reid Hoffman who put out a memo, apparently to journalists after the shooting, yeah. suggesting very seriously that it may have been staged, Dimitri Melhorn. Uh, it, just jaw-dropping stuff from somebody who's really a part of the Democratic mainstream is an ardent Biden supporter, uh, even after the debate, has doubled down on support for Biden. And I think what that speaks to is how the left... Uh, and the Jack Black quip too, how the left likes to act, that it's only on the right that, you know, those toothless rubes see these elections as being existential, that they really are, you know, that their ways of life are really threatened by who's in the Oval Office and who's not. But the left sees it the exact same way. They don't just get, they just don't get any flack for when they talk recklessly about it, except from people on the right. And the left will point to that and be like, oh, you know, you see Fox News did a bunch of segments on on the Jack Black thing. So, you know, it's, it's we're even here. And we're not, we're not even at all, uh, because it's, it's, we, we all know. You don't even need to do a study of it. We all see it very plainly that there's a, a grave imbalance in how uh, this is talked about from one side to the other. Uh, Reed Hoffman himself, who was speaking at this muckety muck conference out uh, in Sun Valley this weekend, clearly called for someone to make a martyr out of Trump. And I have several sources who were in the room who heard it. And now in the wake of all this and his staffer, you know, suggesting the whole thing is a conspiracy theory that it you know, somehow made up or orchestrated, um, he tries to come out and say, oh, I didn't mean it that way. His whole thing is, I, you know, Trump said all these terrible things, bloodbath, all the misrepresentations. And then um, he said, Peter Thiel said, oh, all my lawsuit work against Trump was turning, uh, turning him into a martyr. And I replied that I wish that Trump would martyr himself. And then he adds this, meaning let himself be held accountable for his assaults on and lies about women. Of course, I meant nothing about any sort of physical harm or violence, which I categorically deplore. What a joke. And I replied to him on Twitter as follows. 
Your very attempt to both sides it reveals your insincerity. I have multiple sources who were in the room when you said it, and everyone took away the same meaning. You want Trump dead. You're not fooling anyone. None of these people are. We're keeping the records. And people's professional reputations ought to change as a result of these reactions to an attempted presidential assassination. Tomorrow's going to be a huge day. We're going to know Trump's VP pick. We're going to have the Lester Holt interview of Joe Biden. And we're going to find out, I guess, what direction Democrats are going to go now that they appear to be stuck with this guy against Trump, Trump, who's attained almost superhero status. Emily, what a time to be in news. Seriously, it never stops. <laughs> but it never comes quite this fast. Uh, it's great to see That's you. Thanks true. so much. Thanks, Megan. <laughs> Thanks to all of you as well. We will be here for you tomorrow. Uh, busy week ahead. See you tomorrow.